mascots. Who doesn't love mascots? Without them, how else am I supposed to know what team to root for? Stats? Players? No, no, no. Which team has the funnier looking guy sitting on the sidelines? Those are my people. If you weren't aware, a mascot is one of the most important pieces of modern day marketing. I mean, could you imagine Nintendo without Mario? Or Sega without Sonic? Or Frosted Flakes without Tony the Tiger? Frosted Flakes, good. They're great! <laughs> Having a recognizable face to sell your product is almost like a cheat code. Think about it. Sonic hasn't had a great game since the Bush administration, but since the character design is so good, this furry little blue rat's gonna be here long after the nuclear dust settles. Nintendo could go 15 years without releasing a game and would still probably turn a profit because uh, Mario! He's the best Italian in the world, right up there with Bruno San Martino, Tony Soprano, and... Those are the only three Italians that I know. Now, plenty of companies have taken a crack at creating a recognized face to represent their brand, but that's a little easier said than done. For every Pikachu, Master Chief, and Pac-Man, there's Bonk, Alex Kidd, and Polygon Man. Shout out Bonk, by the way. We really need more Bonk in the modern world. <laughs> All those problems in the Middle East, gone. Just give us Bonk HD. And that's what we're talking about today. Failed video game mascots throughout history. And trust me, there's a lot. So many that I had to rework this video twice to get it to a manageable length because who the hell would want to watch this hot piece of ass talk for an hour about Bubsy? But before we get into that, I want to know, who's your favorite video game character and why? Comment down below. For me personally, I'm a pretty big fan of Conker. I mean, a British squirrel that says the F word, drinks alcohol, and has a hot girlfriend? <laughs> Color me intrigued. Let's start off by asking, what makes a good mascot in the first place? Well, let's take a look at something called the silhouette rule. This rule says that to make an effective character, you should be able to recognize it only by its silhouette, just by its shadow and nothing more. Now, this isn't an absolute rule. Plenty of great characters step outside of these boundaries. It's just more of a way to help simplify the design of a character. So let's play a fun little game, shall we? Can you name these three characters based solely on their silhouettes? Go ahead, I'll wait. Got your answers? Well, by God, you're right! Number one is Marge Simpson, number two is Mr. Krabs, and number three is Academy Award-nominated actor Edward Norton. See how effective that is? So tell me, what's wrong with... This. If I was going to ask you what this was, what would you say? A Nerf football with a toothpick stuck in its side? An old lady judgingly smoking a cigarette while she watches her black neighbors? A male genitalia after an unfortunate incident with a sounding rod? Nope, none of the above. That, my dear sweet viewers, that is the one and only James Pond. Protector of the Pacific, soldier of the seas, and at one point, a video game mascot most commonly associated with the Amiga and the Sega Genesis. James Pond is a suave, intelligent mudskipper who works for the British Secret Service. So the Brits have a secret service now, huh? What secrets do they have to hide? Is it why they talk so funny? I heard it's because instead of a brain, they have prehistoric worms in their head that control their every move. But you didn't hear that from me. No, you didn't hear that from me. The first appearance of our little fish friend here was in James Pond Underwater Agent, developed by Millennium Interactive and released by EA in 1990. The same year that Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. Coincidence? Who can say? The game sees the aforementioned James Pond fight to stop the evil plans of Dr. Maybe, the owner of the evil mega corporation Acme Oil, who's plotting to destroy the oceans with radioactive waste. Now, I'm gonna be honest with you, I'm on this guy's side. Kill the ocean. Have you seen the scary shit that's down there? I'm not a big fan. Now, if you couldn't tell, James Pond is a parody of the world's most famous spy. No, not Stephen Hawking. I'm talking about 007, James Bond. And the parodies don't stop with the main character's name. Dr. Maybe is a reference to the iconic Bond villain Dr. No, and even the levels are named after Bond movies. We have such hits as License to Bubble, A View to a Spill, From Three Mile Island with Love, and Leak and Let Die. 
Now, the original James Pond game received quite a lot of positive reviews, which led to a trilogy being made for our anthropomorphic aquatic agent. In 1991, Millennium Interactive released James Pond 2, codename Robocod. That's right, two whole subtitles. This sequel takes place immediately after the first game, which saw James destroy Acme Oil and stop Dr. Maybe from destroying the oceans. But this wasn't enough to stop the old doc. See, just like any great mind, and he came prepared with a backup plan. Dr. Maybe is going to flee to the North Pole and hold Santa hostage. That's right, kids. Say goodbye to Christmas presents. You're on the naughty list. James Pond must infiltrate the North Pole, free the captive elves, and defeat Dr. Maybe once and for all. But this time, James is equipped with a robotic suit and given the code name Robocod, an obvious reference to Robocop. You see this thing coming at you in a dark Target parking lot. What are you doing? Fun fact, in the original UK version of the game, the penguins are used as an in-game product placement for penguin biscuits. And because of this little advertisement, Penguin outsold arch-rival Kit Kat for the first time in the company's history the month that the game released. Damn, Jimmy, could I get some of that sweet, sweet product placement, please? Just throw me a couple of subscribers. I'm drowning out here, man. The game was better received than the first, being called Polished, Playable, and Fun, which is coincidentally the name of my first adult fiction novel, coming to the Circle K near you. James Pond's big outing finished off with James Pond 3, Operation Starfish, released in 1993. So Dr. Maybe's plan to take over the North Pole was a little bit of a failure, but just like any good villain, he has a backup plan to the backup plan. See, Dr. Maybe learns that the moon is made of a high quality cheese, so he hires an army of rats to mine the moon so that he can conquer the global dairy market. What f***ing drugs were these guys on? The third and final game was also quite well received, just not enough to take on the likes of Mario and Sonic, which led to James Pond being forgotten to the sands of time. Except for his triumphant return in 2011 in a mobile game called James Pond in the Deathly Shallows. Wait, did I say triumphant return? What I meant to say was dog shit f***ing terrible ass dog shit f***ing bad game cash grab dog shit f***ing cash grab nostalgia f***ing bad game fuck bad. And now, James Pond is gone forever. Rest in peace, Agent. I uh, hope Fish Heaven is treating you well. Probably smells fucking terrible up there. <laughs> Now, how about another cool, crime-fighting, anthropomorphic animal? From the oceans to the sky, from the North Pole to the carnival, from James Pond to Arrow the Acrobat. Arrow the Acrobat is an acrobatic bat that served as the short-lived mascot for Sunsoft in the early 90s. Arrow is the world's greatest performer who must stop his arch enemies, Edgar Ector, and Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel from destroying his circus. Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel, huh? I think I just found what I'm gonna name my firstborn child. Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel Smith. Gonna have a great first day of school. The first game was released in August 1993 for the Super Nintendo and Genesis, developed by Iguana Entertainment. The gameplay mechanics for the first game were slightly inspired by the Mappy series. Shout out Mappy, we need more Mappy games. Add it to the list, put it right under Bonk. Bonk, Mappy, we need those now. Get to it, Microsoft. The original concept for Arrow was created by a man named David Siller. The final concept was designed by David's son, Jason Siller, who was inspired by mixing themes from the 70s and 80s. Promotional artwork for the game was shown at the 1993 Consumer Electronics Show in Nevada. And after a lot of positive feedback, Sunsoft had found their new mascot. The game was released to positive reviews, which led to a sequel being developed, the aptly named Arrow the Acrobat 2, released in 1994, also for the Super Nintendo and Genesis. The game was again well received, with praise being levied at the new dark theme, superb graphics, and huge levels. The series also saw a spin-off release around the same time as the sequel, which focused on Arrow's arch nemesis, Zero the Kamikaze Squirrel. And once again, this game was very well received. After three big games and tons of praise being thrown at Arrow, it seemed like Sunsoft had their hit. The mascot to take on all mascots. Well, that was until David Siller left Sunsoft and joined Universal Interactive Studios. 
And as a part of Siller's deal, Universal bought the rights to his creation from Sunsoft with the intention of making Arrow their brand new mascot. Siller begun development on a brand new entry into the franchise for the original PlayStation, titled Arrow the Acrobat 3D. But this concept never reached full development, as Universal turned their attention to a brand new video game character that was taking the world by storm. That's right, in 1996, Naughty Dog released the original Crash Bandicoot game, which was a huge success. And because of that, Universal abandoned Arrow and put all of their eggs in the Crash Bandicoot basket. And call me stupid, but I think they made the right decision there. I know, I know, it's just Arrow the Insane Trilogy just doesn't have the same ring to it. After multiple failed attempts at starting a new Arrow game, Siller eventually left Universal and bought the rights back to his creation, with the intention of making a new game with another studio. But unfortunately, these ideas never went anywhere, even though there were serious conversations with big-name studios like Capcom. And just like that, Arrow was left to be lost, like tears in the rain. Huh? Blade Runner? Huh? References? Yeah? But on August 2nd, 2024, Radalika Games have re-released the original title for Switch, Xbox, and PlayStation. So if you want to experience Crash Bandicoot's less successful older brother, go give it a try and count your lucky stars that it didn't take off. Now it's time to talk about quite possibly the biggest example of a failed mascot in video game history. The inspiration to make this entire video, the legendary Bubsy the Bobcat. The origins of Bubsy can be traced back to a man by the name of Michael Berlin. Berlin was previously known for working on the action-adventure genre with games like Altered Destiny. After working on this genre for most of his career, Michael felt a little burnout and decided to take a break from game development. During this break, he was inspired by the original Sonic the Hedgehog, a game that he reportedly played for 14 hours a day for a week straight. Now those are rookie numbers, brother. That's just the average day in a WoW player's life. This game inspired him to work on his own platformer to rival the titans of the industry. Michael went back to his employer, Accolade Studios, with this idea, and they gave him a team of around 20 people to bring his idea to reality. Development for this new endeavor began in December of 1991. Director of the game, John Skeel, stated in an interview that they wanted to create a game that was as fast as Sonic, but as deep as Mario. A game that was easy to pick up, but difficult to master. Well, they, uh... They did something. Early concept art for the character showed a very different design, like Bubsy wearing an open shirt, using a hoverboard, and wearing bounce shoes. And they had even designed a love interest for the old Bubster, which had been turned down for being too sexualized. And <sighs> thank God for that, how else would I be able to play Bubsy when I'm so hard? After plenty of sessions, the team settled on this iconic design for Bubsy. Talk about a fashion statement, graphic tee, no pants. Calm down, Bubsy, you're jacking my style. The next step was finding the person who would bring Bubsy to life by providing him with a voice. John Skeel apparently had quite a difficult time trying to find the right voice for Mr. Bobcat himself. One person who had thrown his hat into the vocal race was Brian Silva. Skeel liked Silva's voice, but something still just wasn't right. That's when Skeel tried speeding up Silva's voice, and he was shocked. That was it. That was the voice of Bubsy the Bobcat. What could possibly go wrong? Hey, I thought I saw Elvis back there. <sighs> Bubsy's signature catchphrase, what could possibly go wrong, was supposedly derived from a saying around the Accolade development office. And also the same thing that I say when I'm trying to flirt with the plus-size cougar at the bar that no one will go near. In December of 1992, some children who lived near Accolade's development office in San Jose, California, were invited to playtest the game and enjoy a nice fun day with pizza and soda. Imagine trying to do that today. Sheesh. Hey kids, you want to come test a game about a bobcat? Now oh, come on, seriously, we got pizza, we got soda. Gotta be so hard to kidnap a child nowadays. Kids don't want f candy, they want an iPhone 16. The children were asked what they thought of the game, and they suggested adding more secret paths, which was actually picked up. 
resulting in the inclusion of some underground tubes in the first level. Promotion for the game started in January of 1993 at the Consumer Electronics Show, where spectators were greeted by a giant Bubsy character jumping out of a sack. The game was heavily marketed, which earned Bubsy Electronic Gaming Monthly's most hype character of 1993. Bubsy, in Claw's encounter of the third kind, was released in 1993 to some relatively positive reviews. Some criticisms were levied at Bubsy's uncontrollable momentum, which is honestly fair. If you've never played the original Bubsy game, it feels like he's on a giant thick sheet of ice. It's f***ing terrible. But even with those criticisms, the game was a hit, being considered one of the hottest games of the year. The game was such a hit that a pilot episode for an animated series was created in 1993 with the help of Taco Bell. Yes, you heard that correctly. Taco Bell was involved in a Bubsy animated series. What the f*** am I right? The episode was called What Could Possibly Go Wrong, and it aired on Thanksgiving of 1993. The voice of Bubsy was provided by legendary voice actor Rob Paulson. Now I watched this whole pilot so that you don't have to, and I gotta be honest with you, it was one of the most terrible things that I've ever put myself through. And I freebased DMT, alright? You know how parents used to talk about Spongebob like it was the most annoying thing in the world? Well this must be how they felt because, oh my god, it felt like someone was fornicating my ear with a rusty needle. Development for a second Bubsy game actually started months before the first game officially released. Talk about some uber confidence released in the PS2 before the PS1 hits the states. The sequel moved into full production after the original game proved to be a success. However, a new development team within Accolade was responsible for the new game without original creator Michael Berlin's assistance. That's right, they kicked poor Michael to the curb, but don't worry, we're gonna be hearing about him real, real soon. Really, really soon. So, so, so really soon. So, so really soon. So stay tuned for really soon times. Bubsy 2, less creative of a name, was released in October of 1994. The gameplay is very similar to the first game, but unlike its predecessor, players get to choose in which order they complete the levels. Consider it the Elden Ring of this series, a lot of deep lore going on here. And much like the original, Bubsy 2 received a lot of positive reviews, with critics noting that the sequel cleaned up most of the problems from the original game. However, one person wasn't happy with this new title. Original Bubsy creator Michael Berlin. Remember how I said he, we weren't done with him and we'd see him soon? Well, it's, it's now. It's now time. Berlin has strongly criticized the sequel, saying that it almost single-handedly destroyed the franchise. And that Accolade's choice about doing Bubsy 2 in-house with the development team selected was a mistake that pretty much buried him. Bubsy 2 failed due to the mismanagement of the character. It was done by people who, no matter how talented and interested they may have been, had not understood the original vision. Oh well, shit, I'd hate to be on this guy's bad side. Write a whole fucking novel about how you did him wrong. Nevertheless, Accolade moved on to the next title in the Bubsy series, once again without Berlin's help. And this time, the turnaround is almost unbelievable. If my research is correct, Bubsy and Fractured Furry Tales was released just two months later in December of 1994 as an Atari Jaguar exclusive. The game saw Bubsy traversing across various fairy tales, like Jack and the Beanstalk, Alice in Wonderland, and Hansel and Gretel. Like I said earlier, the game was designed as an Atari Jaguar exclusive, which might explain why it's the lowest selling game in the franchise by a large margin. According to internal documentation from Atari Corporation, the game had only sold 9,000 copies by April of 95. Actually insane. I've seen homeless people outside of a Walmart make more money than this. After this catastrophic failure, Accolade decided that it was time to take Bubsy back to his roots. That's right, just three years into Bubsy's life, it was time for a reboot. And it was time to go back to the original creator, Michael Berlin. That's quite the testament to Bubsy if you think about it. Most games take a decade or more before fans start clamoring for the original creators to come back on board. These f***ers did it in one presidential term. So development on the fourth Bubsy game started in April of 1995, with a team of around eight people being led by the original creator, Michael Berlin. That's right, the king is back, baby! According to Berlin, Accolade asked him if he would return to give a much-needed shot in the arm to everyone's favorite bobcat. 
Berlin agreed to return under one condition, that the game would not be just a rehash of the original, that this would be a fresh idea, a new vision. Michael was ready to take Bubsy into the next dimension, the third dimension to be exact. We're talking 3D, baby, three of them, three Ds. I've only got one. And old Michael had a lot to say about how nobody understood Bubsy better than him, so surely he's the one to turn this franchise around, right? Right? Bubsy 3D was developed as a PlayStation exclusive, but due to the console limitations at the time, the team couldn't create a big, nice, beautiful world, and instead were forced to fill the world with these flat-shaped polygons. However, Berlin didn't look at this as a bad thing, because now players would be forced to keep their eye on Bubsy instead of getting distracted by the beautiful graphics. <laughs> Berlin attended the January 1996 Consumer Electronics Show to help personally demonstrate Bubsy 3D. However, while wandering the floor, he saw another 3D platformer that was set to release two months before Bubsy 3D. That game was a little title, you might have heard of it, it's a little obscure, I wouldn't blame you. Super Mario 64? After seeing how detailed and beautiful Mario 64 was, Berlin realized that Bubsy 3D was greatly inferior to Nintendo's flagship N64 title. But unfortunately, Accolade was committed to releasing the game at the date that they had set, meaning that it was too late to really do anything. The team was forced to release the game in an inferior state. Bubsy 3D released in November of 1996 to extremely negative reviews, modern sources cited as one of the worst games of all time. The game was criticized for its tank controls, repetitive gameplay, and frankly it just didn't stand up to the other hit platformers releasing at the time, like Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. How crazy is that? This absolute garbage released in the same three month span as Mario 64 and Crash Bandicoot. Alright Jimmy, you know the deal, which game do you want for Christmas? Really, Mario, are you sure you don't want the bobcat that's stuck in existential dread? The game was so bad that it killed the franchise for more than 20 years. The ownership of Bubsy changed hands quite a few times over the next couple of decades. Until in June 2017, when Hong Kong-based holding company Billionsoft announced that it would be developing a new Bubsy game, along with Black Forest Games. And that led to the October 2017 release of Bubsy's big comeback, Bubsy, in the Woolly Strike Back. A 2D platformer similar to the original game, except this one was terrible. It just feels so hollow and lifeless. You can tell this isn't a labor of love from developers who are passionate about the franchise. This is nothing more than a cheap cash grab attempting to capitalize on nostalgia. But despite the negativity, this didn't prevent another entry in the Bubsy series being released in 2019, Bubsy Paws on Fire. This time being developed by Choice Provisions, a development studio from California that were supposedly fans of the Bubsy franchise. However, this game differs a little bit from every other game in the franchise because this game is an auto runner. Yeah, you know those Mario Maker levels that no one likes? Yeah, imagine that, but, but with this annoying ass character. Yeah, you could say that that's a choice. See, that's supposed to be a joke because the, the development studio that, that made this game was called Choice Provisions. See, you probably forgot about that. That would have been so funny if you were paying attention. Now, the future of Bubsy is still up in the air as Atari SA have reacquired over 100 titles from Billionsoft, including the Bubsy franchise. And in an October 2023 interview, Atari CEO Wade Rosen announced that the company was open to hearing pitches for a new installment in the franchise. So for all my creative minds out there, please direct your emails to this man. And Wade, if you're hearing this, I've got an idea for you. How about this, all right? How about Bubsy fights off an evil villain who's trying trying to mine the moon for cheese because they want to conquer the global dairy market and for oh, f we're talking about James Pond 3. Well, that's all I've got for today. If you stuck around to the end of the video, seriously, thank you. It means the most. And before I go, I want to know, who is your favorite mascot that we talked about today? For me personally, I think I'm the new number one fan of James Pond. When are we going to get James Pond and Smash? James Pond and Fortnite? James Pond cameo in the Avengers? But throughout this whole discussion, I think I learned something today. It doesn't matter if you're the most popular person around. You're still valuable. You're still memorable. People still love you. 
You may not be the Mario or the Sonic of your life. You may be the Bubsy, and that's okay, because everyone needs a, a Bubsy in their life. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't say that with a straight face. You guys are fucking losers. Man, I remember the first time I played a Mario game. That was a big day for little old Johnny. It's right up there with the first time I smoked weed and the first time I touched a breast. I mean, come on guys, seventh grade was a big year for me. I mean, it's a game changer, man. You're telling me that I'm controlling this little Italian man on my screen and making him squash aliens? I felt invincible. It was awesome. Probably the last time that I truly felt joy.